A man was licked by his dog. This is how his organs shut down. JD is a 63-year-old man presenting to the emergency room with fever and shortness of breath. He tells the admitting nurse that purplish spots had developed all around his face starting about three days ago, and that the feeling in his right leg had started going numb. JD was healthy at 63 years old. He hadn't been to the hospital recently, and he hadn't traveled anywhere. Whatever was happening to him was something new. At examination, bruise-like spots were found all over his legs. There were no cuts or wounds present. If you put these together with fever and shortness of breath in someone who was fine just a couple of days ago, then this kind of looks like an infection. Good thing he didn't have a headache with neck stiffness, because if he did, that could mean meningitis, which is an infection that affects the brain. A blood test reveals that JD has lymphocytopenia. Lympho derived from Latin lympha, the goddess of water, and today referring to a type of white blood cell that fights infection. Cyto meaning cell, and penia meaning a deficiency of. A deficiency of white blood cells that fight infection. This was combined with an increase in blood markers that indicate that JD has increased inflammation, meaning that his immune system is now more active than normal. There was definitely something going on. Additional tests revealed that JD had thrombocytopenia. Thrombo from ancient Greek thrombus, meaning a piece or a lump, today referring to a blood clot, a deficiency of blood clot cells. This makes sense because markers reveal that he has liver dysfunction. The liver is supposed to make blood clotting factors that stop you from bleeding when you get a cut. A dysfunctional liver means that those clotting factors aren't being made properly, and this fits with thrombocytopenia, giving the medical team some more clues as to what's happening because it's found that JD has acute kidney injury. Muscle proteins were found floating around in his body, meaning that his muscles were breaking down, actually dissolving away. These muscle proteins get caught in his kidneys and start to damage the tubules. All of this is only the start of his problems. When you work out, your muscles produce lactic acid as a metabolic byproduct from increased activity, but for JD, so much lactic acid was found in him that he's in acidosis. There was no indication that he was doing any strenuous exercise, meaning that large parts of his body might not be receiving enough oxygen in compliance with the demand for normal function. Without taking medicines or any history of other disease, but with a fever and skin reaction, this could point to a possible massive bacteremia, or bacterial presence in blood. The fever, the liver dysfunction, the dissolving muscles and kidney failure, all of these add up to a medical emergency with impending, life-threatening consequences as JD is admitted into the hospital. Multiple antibiotics were started empirically. This means that the medical team doesn't know exactly which bacteria is floating around in his body at the moment, so they want to cover as much as they can during this time. The reason that this is done is because figuring out which bacteria is causing his problems is going to take days. Samples need to be collected from the body, and from those samples, bacteria needs to be grown and cultured to get a measurable amount that can be identified. The days that this will take are days that JD doesn't have, because his muscles are dissolving inside of him, and his organs are all shutting down. As the hours pass, JD's mental status starts to decline. He becomes disoriented and confused. This encephalopathy means that his liver isn't just dysfunctional, he's now in acute liver failure. More monitoring finds that his kidneys are worsening. His intestines are now obstructed because the muscles of his GI tract have become paralyzed as the bruising on his skin becomes a deeper purple color. As the night continues, a hospital code is announced on the hospital speakers. JD's heart has stopped beating. Doctors, nurses, and pharmacists immediately converge on his room to try to bring him back. Several minutes pass. A heartbeat comes back, and he's resuscitated. But his blood pressure is still low. A tube is placed down his throat, and he's put on mechanical ventilation. Medicines are administered to him to both constrict his blood vessels and to promote the force of his heart contractions. All of this is done because if his organs are not perfused with blood because of that low blood pressure, the bad things happening to him will worsen. But as time continues, those bad things continue to worsen. The kidneys are supposed to filter blood. If they don't, metabolic waste begins to build up. And because he isn't getting any better, his kidney failure continues to decline, and he's put on a machine that does that filtering for him, something called dialysis. If JD was previously healthy, what is even happening? How can he go from living normal life one day to having his heart stop in a hospital bed just a few days later? Blood culture results from the lab return to the medical team. A gram-negative, rod-shaped bacteria identified as Capnocytophagia canamorsis was found. This bacteria lives in the mouths of pet dogs and cats. 
It doesn't affect canine or feline life forms. It doesn't live natively inside humans. If a human comes into contact with this bacteria, the immune system almost always destroys it, protecting our bodies from infection. But if a human gets a bite from those animals and this person is immunocompromised, meaning that their immune system isn't working properly, then this bacteria can proliferate and spill into the bloodstream. And when the body issues a generalized response to this bacteria in the bloodstream, the uncontrolled reaction by the immune system shuts down the entire body. When you get a cut, the surrounding area becomes swollen, red, and warm. This inflammation is the immune system sending white blood cells, sending chemical and protein signals to the site of injury. The walls of the blood vessels are forced to relax by these mediators so that more immune cells can enter the site as fluid rushes in, causing the swelling. This is similar to what's happening to JD, except instead of a small localized region of a cut, his entire body's blood vessels are forced to relax, causing his blood pressure to drop. Without adequate pressure to push the blood through the organs, it results in tissue ischemia. Isk from an old Greek word meaning to restrain, and emia meaning presence of blood. A restrained presence of blood in the tissues. As less oxygen from the blood reaches the organs, their dysfunction begins to set in. The inner lining of the blood vessels in these organs start to develop lesions. This is because activated white blood cells bind to the cells of this lining, forcing the release of reactive chemicals, injuring them and forming lesions all along this lining. The result of this cellular insult means that the blood vessel narrows, making it even harder for blood to pass through the organs. When combined with a low pressure to push that blood through, the organs aren't just dysfunctional anymore, they're starting to fail. As less oxygen is delivered to the organs, mitochondrial dysfunction starts to happen in the cell. Respiratory enzymes that make the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell become inhibited, meaning that energy is no longer produced properly. Stress begins to build up as mitochondrial DNA begins to break down. The same chemical that dilates the blood vessels in inflammatory response approaches the inner membrane and the matrix proteins of the mitochondria and begins to dissolve the mitochondrial ultrastructure. Instead of a powerhouse, the mitochondria degrades into a sludge that promotes cell death and causing all of his organs to shut down. This is called sepsis, and the resulting low blood pressure is septic shock. If capnocytophagia canamorsis bacteria is swarming around in his blood and forcing his immune system to react this way, where did it come from and how did it enter his body? Closer examination of JD finds no dog bite marks, no scratch marks, so those are ruled out. He was previously healthy, meaning that he has no history of immunodeficiency or history of taking medicines that could compromise his immune system. His family confirmed that JD did love his pets. He was very close with them. The spleen is an organ that recycles old red blood cells, but it also stores white blood cells, which are integral to the immune system. If someone doesn't have a spleen, then they could be predisposed to an infection from capnocytophagia. But JD's spleen was functional, meaning that all of this points to a misfortune and a freak accident, because without a bite mark or any predisposing factors that would indicate immunocompromise, it means some degree of licking and puppy kisses delivered Capnocytophagia canamorsis from the dog's mouth to some entrance in JD's body, whether through his mouth or through the pores of his skin, as this zoonosis was spread all throughout his body. A Capnocytophagia infection is rare. In the United States, millions of people have dogs, and the infection isn't even tracked. In the Netherlands, a record of 0.67 cases per 1 million people happen per year, meaning that JD is less than one in a million. And among those who do have a capnocytophagia infection, the fatality rate is around 25%, meaning because he's one in a million already, there's a chance that he could be one in four too. Additional antibiotics were added to his regimen. As the days pass, JD's fever clears. Repeat blood tests find some improvements in some markers, but worsening in others. On the eighth day of hospitalization, a fungus named Candida albicans was found in his blood. Fungus has nothing to do with a dog. Where did that come from? Well, some clinical implications need to be accounted for here. Candida is present in your gut microbiome. This would be all the microscopic organisms that live inside your stomach and intestines to help you digest. When broad spectrum antibiotics are given, like in JD's case, lots of the bacteria in that microbiome are incidentally eliminated. But Candida is a fungus. Antibiotics don't affect fungus that way. It starts to take over, reproduce in mass, and cause a fungal overgrowth. Because JD was in the intensive care unit, a central line was placed. This gives the medical team access into his body. Candida lives on your skin. It's not affecting you 
right now because you're probably not admitted in the intensive care unit. But as the catheter has a connection directly to a central vein in JD through his skin, it introduces a vector for the fungus to enter his body and to colonize, increasing his risk for infection the longer that it's in place. An antifungal medicine was added to JD. His skin started blistering, and 10 days after the initiation of antibiotics, signs of systemic infection were still present. Blood tests seemed to normalize in him. His thrombocytopenia seemed to resolve. His muscles didn't seem to be dissolving anymore. But the next day, the nurse alerts everyone that JD's fever has returned. More tests find that inflammatory markers were rising again. Typically, if a patient is starting to improve, but the fever returns in the intensive care unit, this could indicate a hospital-acquired infection. But in the ICU, most of these parameters can be controlled, so yet another antibiotic was added again to JD. A CT scan of his chest revealed possible pneumonia, this time from a new fungus, Aspergillus fumigatus, as was detected in the secretions from his trachea. Antifungal medicine was changed, and his antibiotic regimen was simplified. For the next few days, JD was improving again. But four days later, an abdominal CT scan revealed that the blood flow to his spleen is now obstructed. This infarction, a Latin word meaning to stuff or to pack into, means that something has caused a blood clot to be stuffed into a vessel of his spleen. The scan confirms a complete infarction, meaning that all blood flow was obstructed as the organ starts to necrose. As doctors look at JD, they see all four of his limbs have developed gangrene, meaning that the blood supply has been cut off from them and that the tissue is no longer viable. If he survives this, it's likely that he won't have his original limbs to use for the rest of his life. Sepsis has been known to humans for several thousand years now. The ancient Egyptians used these hieroglyphs to describe a principle, something that couldn't be seen by the eye that was contained near what we know now as the intestines. This principle could travel up to the heart and cause death. Today, we know that as bacteria because we're able to see it with microscopes, but ancient Egyptians didn't have microscopes, meaning that they knew something from the gut can cause very bad problems. The interesting thing about these glyphs is that the fifth one is not pronounced. It indicates that the word or the idea presented by the immediate previous glyphs are describing something disgusting. In the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for the brain, that same final glyph is present, meaning that the ancients thought that the brain was something disgusting. But the Greeks developed the Egyptian idea of self-intoxication from something disgusting stemming from the intestines in the brain. They used the word sepsis, which implied a bad smell, and it was contrasted with peepsis, which described a concoction of some sort. Hippocrates wrote that sepsis was the process by which flesh decays, swamps generate foul airs and smells, and the process by which wounds fester. Clearly, he knew something that he couldn't see with his eyes was the cause of all of these problems. In the West, it took 2,000 years to further develop these ideas. In 1684, an Italian physician Francesco Redi ran an experiment to see if sepsis really produced small creatures spontaneously, as written by Aristotle. He took pots filled with meat, fish, or cheese and let them rot in the open. Flies gathered and laid eggs, creating maggots. He repeated the experiment, this time with a fine gauze covering the meat, fish, or cheese. Flies gathered, but this time they could only lay their eggs on the gauze. No maggots grew in the baits, meaning that small creatures don't spontaneously generate from the process of sepsis. Today, we know that the idea behind these hieroglyphs is bacteria. And even more recently, Capnocytophagia canamorsis used to be called DF2 in pre-1990 literature because it hadn't been classified as a new species. The first case was reported in 1961, California, when a 17-year-old boy who had undergone a splenectomy, that is a removal of his spleen, three years earlier for a football injury, had sustained a dog bite and fell ill days later. Several reports describing DF2 are in literature before 1989, when it was finally given the name Capnocytophagia canamorsis. And while germ theory of disease gave a basis for bacteria causing sepsis, it didn't explain why patients' organs still shut down in the cases when the target bacteria was successfully eliminated from the body. This multi-organ failure is the same one that's happening to JD. Another CT scan is done on his head. In his brain, severe hypoxia or low oxygen was found with a swelling of fluid. Because the brain is enclosed in the skull, there isn't much room for it to expand when there is a swelling of fluid, meaning that permanent brain damage is happening right now to JD. The medical team meets with his family, and it's determined that therapy will be de-escalated. If he comes back from this, 
he will have permanent brain damage. He won't have his original arms and legs to use anymore, and there will likely be loss of normal function for all of his organs. In septic shock, sometimes it's not just the bacteria itself that causes the problems, it's how the body responds. Starting with the tissue ischemia, almost everything described in the process of the organs shutting down was not just caused by the bacteria, but also by the human immune system. The nitric oxide dilation of the blood vessels caused low blood pressure. The white blood cells caused endothelial damage to the lining of the blood vessels and caused microcirculatory lesions, narrowing the vessel, worsening the decrease in blood flow in the face of severe hypotension. Capnocytophage acanamorsis is one of the most lethal sepsis pathogens described. It's right up there with Neisseria meningitidis and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Those names tell you exactly what they cause. Capnocytophagia can live inside white blood cells after it has been phagocytosed or eaten by them. So as the immune system tries to destroy the bacteria, they hide inside instead. And they can do this because they create an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide that would have otherwise destroyed them inside the immune cells. This is something called catalase. And as they reproduce, break out, and diffuse through the bloodstream, the immune system reacts systemically as capnocytophagia spills everywhere. Small blood clots form as the complement system is activated from inflammation before the liver shuts down. These clots lodge into the extremities, cutting off blood flow to them, causing gangrene to develop as the tissue starts to necrose, just like what happened to JD. On day 16 of his admission, the therapy was finished. Days later, he was returned home to family for processions. The point of this case is not to scare anyone of their animal. The infection is rare enough that it's not tracked in the United States. If you aren't immunocompromised and you're a healthy person with a strong immune system, getting licked by your dog or cat is probably not going to be a problem. But the point of this case is to say, if you have pets and you're very close with them physically, if you develop flu-like symptoms that are worse than a simple viral infection, you wanna get that checked out. What I'm talking about is things like an intense fever with bruise-like spots that develop under the skin in places that you haven't bumped. Big, dark spots that rapidly develop or something like a severe shortness of breath. Don't wait. Get it checked out immediately. I think most folks know of someone in their life who had a fever and a couple days later passed away in the hospital. There's a good chance that that was some degree of sepsis from either waiting too long or from a freak accident and anyone watching who is in clinical practice or comes into contact with patients, you know that the clinical course for a patient with bacteremia and sepsis can decline in just a couple of hours. And I'm sure you've all heard or seen yourself situations when you come back for your next shift and that patient is no longer with us. Even if the incidence is less than one person per million, there's more than 300 million people here in the United States. So statistically, around 300 people can get an infection from a dog licking them, biting them, or anything that has to do with a dog's mouth, just like in JD's case. So take care of yourself and be well.